Chapter 8, Part 2 of Memoirs of the Lady Hester Stanhope, Volume 3, by Lady Hester Stanhope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 8, Part 2 Wednesday, June 20th. I rose rather late and was told by my family that a curious figure of a European on a mule, followed by a servant dressed as a sailor, and coming from Lady Hester's house, had passed our gate just before with two mule loads of luggage, altogether bearing the appearance of a traveling peddler. What can this mean? thought I. This cannot be the stranger I heard of in Sida, for he was dressed in the costume of the country. But perhaps this is some traveling merchant who has been to show his European wares to her ladyship. Sunset came, and after dinner I joined Lady Hester. She began as I entered the saloon with, Well, doctor, I have got rid of him. "'Of whom?' I asked. "'Oh,' rejoined she, "'such a deep one, "'a Russian spy from the embassy at Constantinople. "'But he got nothing out of me, "'although he tried in all sorts of ways. "'I as good as told him he was a spy. "'And the Russians employ such clever men "'that I thought it best you should not see him.' for he would have pumped you without your suspecting his design, and have been more than a match for you. I dare say he is affronted because I packed him off so soon. I told him his fortune. You should have seen his flaws and have heard him talk. It was quite a comedy." He asked me if it was true that I could describe a person's character merely by looking at him. Yes, said I, and although I don't see very well, and the candles give a very bad light, I will describe yours, if you like, and without giving him time to stop me, I hit it off so exactly that he exclaimed, Really, my lady, it is quite, quite wonderful. But now he is gone, I must tell you that there is another person here, a sort of savant. Here, take this little book which he has given to me. But you know, I don't pretend to understand such things. It is something he has written about hieroglyphics. Look at it, and then go and sit a little with him. After casting my eye over the work, I went to the stranger's garden and introduced myself. It was Dr. Love, the great orientalist and linguist, whom the newspapers had designated as librarian to his royal highness the D of S, although I had thought that another gentleman of the medical profession held that honorable post. His knowledge of tongues was prodigious, I passed an hour or two with him, whilst he explained some of the objects of his eastern researches. One thing struck me very forcibly, that of all Europeans who study the literature of the East, the Jew has a decided advantage, inasmuch as his school studies in Hebrew render the transition to Arabic a step of no more difficulty than from Latin to Italian. When I went back to Lady Hester and told her that Dr. Louvre, as I thought, had been sent out at the expense of one of the Oriental societies, or else at that of the Duke of S., and that he had spoken very highly of His Royal Highness's library and learning, Lady Hester hallooed out, "'Oh, Lord, Doctor, the D of S. Learned? If I were to see him, I would tell him when and where he was laid across his horse drunk. But I loved all the princes, all except George the Fourth. 
they were so lively so good-natured people who would laugh at a straw thursday june twenty first i rode down to shamauni to see wellington but not without some misgivings for the groom who accompanied me related several things which made me suspect that the road was no longer safe he had heard that between tyr and acre there was no passing and said he what is to prevent any desperate villain or gang of villains from attacking anybody anywhere our very governors hardly dare stir out of the towns and who is to go in pursuit of robbers now they know that for the country is ready to rise and in four or five days we shall perhaps see strange doings after visiting the black whose state was far from improving i entered sida i learned that from some villages a hundred and fifty horsemen had marched off the preceding night to join the insurgents that at garifi a distance of four hours from june cattle had been carried off that between acre and sida travelling had become dangerous at a village called halalia the people had shut up their houses and taken refuge in the city nay the monks of dair el michaelis had packed up their valuables and church ornaments and sent them to sida the people in the gardens had also taken the alarm and no longer slept there as is customary in the summer season when i got back to the dar i told all this news to lady hester stanhope oh said she that's not all the people of june are in a fright and were going to desert the village and fatoum has been asking leave to bring her mother's cow into my cowhouse but i sent word over to them to remain where they are and that no harm should come to them m Guy, before setting off to aleppo had raised on a bill of her ladyship's twenty-seven thousand piastres. These were in the house. Would it be right, said I, to pay the servants the six months' wages due to them, so that if anything happens, each person may take care of his own? Oh, answered Lady Hester, I don't fear. I would throw all my doors open if the Druses were on the outside and should not be afraid that anybody would touch me. My family, in the meantime, remained in total ignorance of what was going on around them. They ate, drank, slept, and walked out, totally unconscious of danger. I did not apprehend that these reports would come to their ears for they understood very little Arabic, and even if they had, the Arabs, generally speaking, have so much tact in knowing when they ought to be silent that I thought myself safe in that respect. But I was mistaken. An old, chattering washerwoman, in bringing home the linen, began a long speech, addressing herself to me, as I was smoking at the door, about the risk that woman ran in being away from any habitation in these lawless times. Do you know, said she, there are deserters in the woods and disabled soldiers in the high roads? And it was but yesterday that those ladies were an hour's distance off in the forest that leads to the river for some neighbors of mine who had taken their grists to the water-mill saw them by the prophet you do wrong to let them go so far we had yesterday two of ibrahim pasha's soldiers in the village begging each with one hand only for the druses had taken them prisoners and cut off their right hands but though they can't fight they are very dangerous men. 
for you see they are Egyptians. The woman talked with much vehemence, and although I silenced her by answering that I would inquire into it, she had said enough to excite suspicion in those who stood by listening that something was not right, and I was obliged to disclose part of the truth. Friday, June 22nd. Lady Hester dictated a very uncivil letter to Signor Lapi, the Austrian referendary, in which she said things as if coming from me. It was not an unusual way with her to employ my name to repeat her opinions, by which people were offended who afterwards vented their spite in some way or another. It was one of her many maneuvers to keep people aloof from each other when it suited her purposes. Twenty years before, I had a serious quarrel with Shaikh Ibrahim, Mr. Burkhart, in the same way. She, not having so high an opinion of that gentleman as people in general had, but this was independent of his literary merits and on different grounds. Lady Hester related to me a dream that someone had had about her, in which a hand waving over her head and several crowned heads humbled before her were interpreted to indicate the greatness that just now, as she flattered herself, awaited her. What reason she had for thinking that relief from all her troubles was near at hand, the reader has had opportunity of judging. She was always disposed, however, to see things in their brightest aspect. Yesterday plunged into difficulties, and today extricating herself, if not in reality, at least in imagination. I am, said she, like the man in the eastern story, who, imprisoned in a dungeon and nearly starved to death, found in a poor sailor an old acquaintance, who conveyed to him secretly a basin of warm soup. But just as he was putting it to his mouth, a rat fell from the ceiling and knocked it out of his hand. Reduced thus to the lowest pitch of wretchedness, and seeing nothing left for him but to die, at the critical moment came a firman from Constantinople to cut off the head of the pasha who had thrown him into prison, and he was saved. So it is with me. I cannot be worse off than I am. I shall, therefore, when the next steamboat comes, see what it brings." and if i hear no news about the property that was left me i shall get rid of you and everybody and of all the women and with one black slave and logmoggy i shall order the gateway to be walled up leaving only room enough for my cows to go in and out to pasture and i shall have no communication with any human being I shall write to Lord Palmerston before you go, and tell him that, as he has thrown an aspersion on my name, I shall remain walled in here until he publicly removes it. And if he or anybody writes to me, there will be no answer. For when you are gone, I shall have nobody to write for me. This sort of life, perhaps, will suit me best, after all. I have often wished that I could have a room in my garden, and lying there with only some necessary covering, slip from my bed as I was into my garden, and after a turn or two slip back again. I do assure you I should neither be low-spirited nor dull. Today, a letter was brought from an English traveller, Mr. M., to Lady Hester, the purport of which was that a gentleman of an ancient and honourable family was desirous of paying his respects to her. 
Lady Hester, asked me to go down to Sida, to call on him and say she should be happy to see him. Accordingly, next morning I went. I found a gentleman, of about forty or forty-two years of age, installed at the customary lodging of the English, and after delivering my message and conversing with him a little while, I left him to see Wellington, the black, and go in search of news. I learned from Khosrow Effendi, the government secretary, that one of Ibrahim's regiments, sent to quell the rising in Hasbaya and Rashaya, had been compelled by the superior numbers of the insurgents to shut themselves up in the castle, and were there closely besieged, expecting a reinforcement from Damascus to their relief. Towards Jerusalem, some manifestations of rising had been made, and nearer to June, some bodies of insurgents, and their way from different villages to join the main body in Rashaya and Haran, had in passing Batedin, the Emir Bashir's residence, uttered loud and reviling menaces and cries. The Emir, being deprived of arms to put his dependents in a state of defense, had sent to Beirut to demand four hundred muskets, and had induced the patriarch of the Maronite Christians to assemble some of the chief sheiks and to bind them with an oath not to join the Druzes. He had dispatched couriers to the Matuli country, the mountains running parallel with the sea from Sida to Acre, and in some measure a continuation of Mount Lebanon, calling on the chieftains to hold their allegiance to Ibrahim Pasha. But it was considered that all these were measures of little use, should the Christians and Matulis see a chance of expelling their oppressors. The inhabitants of the peaceable villages kept themselves in readiness on the first alarm to fly to the towns for security. Looking, however, dispassionately at the probabilities of success between the rival parties, it is not likely, considering that the Egyptian satrap holds all the strong places, that the Druzes can do anything more than carry on a harassing warfare unless powerful aid comes from without, and ships of war blockade Acre, Beirut, and the other ports. I saw Wellington. His case presented little hope. Dysentery had supervened, and feeble as he already was, I judged it impossible that he could survive. Sunday, June 24th. Mr. M. came up and remained, I forget whether, two or three days. He told me he was of Trinity College, Cambridge, but had been a long time abroad. Lady Hester said of him, I like to converse with such people as are what you call country squires. One hears a great many anecdotes from them. Sometimes he makes very sensible remarks, and sometimes he's very strange. He asked me if I knew the Emir Bashir, and when I was giving him some information about him, all of a sudden he asked me if I liked dancing when I lived in England. He goes from one thing to another, like a dog in a fair, I laughed. Yes, doctor, just like a dog that goes from one booth to another, sniffing here and there and stealing gingerbread nuts. When he sat with me in the evening, he was constantly turning his head to the window, which was open, as if he thought somebody was coming in that way. Tuesday, June 26th. Mr. M. went away. Wednesday, June 27th. A letter came from two more travelers, 
dated from the quarantine ground where the black lay ill. Colonel Hazetta, the writer, informed her ladyship that he had traveled over land from Calcutta and was commissioned to deliver to her a letter from her nephew, Colonel T. Taylor. But he alleged the impossibility of being the bearer of it himself owing to the necessity he was under of proceeding onward to Beirut and performing his quarantine there. He was accompanied by Dr. Mill. Thursday, June 28th. I received a note acquainting me with the death of Wellington, and I rode down to inform myself of the circumstances of his end. By Signor Lapi's care, he was decently interred in the Catholic burial ground at Sida. What religion he was of, I never heard him say. But he is what is called a pious youth, and told me his mother had brought him up in the practice of virtue and godliness. And from what I saw of him, I believe he spoke truly for he was of great singleness of mind, artless, ingenuous, and grateful to the Duke, his master, and to Lady Hester, for the kindnesses they had shown him. But who shall console his poor mother? I collected a little news from which the Pasha's affairs seemed to wear a better aspect. He had marched, it was said, with two regiments and some field pieces against the rebels at Hasbea, and had sacked the place. The Haran, it was reported, was also reduced to obedience. Friday, June 29th. Today, Lady Hester wrote a letter to Lord Palmerston, an answer to one she had received from him, which I shall first transcribe. Lord Palmerston to Lady Hester Stanhope. Foreign Office, April 25th, 1838. Madame, I am commanded by the Queen to acquaint you that I have laid before Her Majesty your letter of the 12th of February of this year. It has been my duty to explain to Her Majesty the circumstances which may be supposed to have led to your writing that letter, and I have now to state to your ladyship that any communications which have been made to you on the matters to which your letter refers, either through the friends of your family or through Her Majesty's agent and consul general at Alexandria, have been suggested by nothing but a desire to save your ladyship from the embarrassments which might arise if the parties who have claims upon you were to call upon the consul general to act according to the strict line of his duty under the capitulations between great britain and the port i have the honour to be madam your ladyship's most obedient, humble servant, Palmerston. End of chapter 8, part 2「Eight, part 3 of Memoirs of the Lady Hester Stanhope, volume 3, by Lady Hester Stanhope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 8, Part 3 Lady Hester Stanhope to Lord Palmerston, June, Mount Lebanon, July 1st, 1838 My Lord, if your diplomatic dispatches are as obscure as the one which now lies before me, it is no wonder that England should cease to have that proud preponderance in her foreign relations which she once could boast of your lordship tells me that you have thought it your duty to explain to the queen the subject which caused me to address her majesty i should have thought my lord that it would have been your duty to have made those explanations 
prior to having taken the liberty of using her majesty's name and alienated from her and her country a subject who the great and small must acknowledge however painful it may be to some has raised the english name in the east higher than any one has yet done besides having made many philosophical researches of every description for the advantage of human nature at large and this without having spent one farthing of the public money whatever may be the surprise created in the minds of statesmen of the old school respecting the conduct of government towards me i am not myself in the least astonished for when the son of a king with a view of enlightening his own mind and the world in general had devoted part of his private fortune to the purchase of a most invaluable library at hamburg he was flatly refused an exemption from the custom-house duties but if report speaks true had an application been made to pass bandboxes millinery inimitable wigs and invaluable rouge it would have been instantly granted by her majesty's ministers if we may judge by precedence therefore my lord i have nothing to complain of yet i shall go on fighting my battles campaign after campaign your lordship gives me to understand that the insult which i have received was considerately bestowed upon me to avoid some dreadful unnameable misfortune which was pending over my head i am ready to meet with courage and resignation every misfortune it may please god to visit me with but certainly not insult from man if i can be accused of high crimes and misdemeanors and that i am to stand in dread of the punishment thereof let me be tried as i believe i have a right to be by my peers if not then by the voice of the people disliking the english because they are no longer english no longer that hardy honest bold people that they were in former times yet as some few of this race must remain i should rely in confidence upon their integrity and justice when my case had been fully examined it is but fair to make your lordship aware that if by the next packet there is nothing definitively settled respecting my affairs and that i am not cleared in the eyes of the world of aspersions intentionally or unintentionally thrown upon me i shall break up my household and build up the entrance gate to my premises there remaining as if in a tomb till my character has been done justice to and a public acknowledgment put in the papers signed and sealed by those who have aspersed me there is no trifling with those who have pit blood in their veins upon the subject of integrity nor expecting that their spirit would ever yield to the impertinent interference of consular authority meanly endeavouring as colonel campbell has attempted to do to make the origin of this business an application of the viceroy of egypt to the english government i must without having made any inquiries upon the subject exculpate his highness from so low a proceeding his known liberality in all such cases from the highest to the lowest class of persons is such as to make one the more regret his extraordinary and reprehensible conduct towards his great master and that such a man should become totally blinded by vanity and ambition which must in the end prove his perdition an opinion i have loudly given from the beginning your lordship talks to me 
of the capitulations with the sublime port. What has that to do with a private individual's having exceeded his finances and trying to do good? If there is any punishment for that, you had better begin with your ambassadors, who have often indebted themselves at the different courts of Europe as well as at Constantinople. I myself am so attached to the Sultan that were the reward of such conduct that of losing my head, I should kiss the saber wielded by so mighty a hand. Yet, at the same time, treat with the most ineffable contempt your trumpery agents, as I shall never admit of their having the smallest power over me. If I did, I should belie my origin. Hester Lucy Stanhope here, let me ask the reader whether Lady Hester had not indeed a right to be indignant with the minister who then directed the foreign affairs of the country, for the illiberal manner in which he gratified his spleen and mortified vanity. He had not the power of directly stopping the payment of her pension, it being a parliamentary grant but he had recourse to the unworthy artifice of directing his agent not to sign the certificate of her life without which her pension could not be paid nothing can be added to the well-merited castigation inflicted upon him and he has brought down upon himself the condemnation of all men of good breeding and generous sentiment what his present feelings on the subject may be, it is impossible to say. But I would fain hope that there are few who are disposed to envy him, much less to follow his example. This day an English sloop of war hove to off Sida. The captain of her sent for the English consular agent alongside, and what took place on this occasion may serve as an example of the necessity of having Englishmen and not foreigners as consular agents in distant countries. The precise object that the captain of the sloop had in view, of course, can only be known to himself. But what queries he put to Mr. Abella, the agent, and what answers he received very soon transpired since how could it be otherwise when the agent was a native of syria and understood no language but arabic being therefore summoned to the ship which he could not go aboard as she could not communicate with persons from the shore until her bill of health had been examined by the health officers, he was first of all compelled to take some one as an interpreter between the captain and himself, and then to hold his parley from the boat to the ship's quarter. But as the interpreter might only speak Italian, and the captain only English, a third aid is required, and we will suppose an officer to be called, who takes the question from the captain's mouth in English, repeats it in Italian to the agent's interpreter, who translates it into Arabic. And then the answer goes back through the same channels, so that it must necessarily happen that the sense and the wording undergo a material change but there is yet a greater evil. If the questions relate to matters of importance, as the progress of the Druze insurrection, for example, or the probability of Ibrahim Pasha's success or defeat, how is the consular agent so circumstanced to give a faithful account? For should he divulge matters unfavorable to the Pasha's cause, his well-being and perhaps his life may be endangered since although he himself as an agent in the english service receives a certain protection 
he may have brothers and relations who are at the pasha's mercy nay he himself perhaps an agent to-day and dismissed to-morrow may be left to cope with powerful enemies for the rest of his life now the french government secures frenchmen for consuls and agents and the english government one would think ought to act on the same principle might it not be said that men could not be found native englishmen willing to banish themselves to these countries and that for a very trifling salary among the half-pay officers of the army and navy might be selected numbers who even for so small a stipend as two hundred a year would willingly accept such situations because a very short residence would show them that with economy a hundred a year in the levant is equivalent to two at home in affairs where the conflicting interests of english and mahometans or disputes between travellers and natives are to be settled it is absurd to suppose that an agent accustomed to cringe and fawn to the turks all his life will or can ever obtain redress for the party whose country he represents it is impossible saturday june thirtieth lady hester had sent to dair el kamar for old pierre and he arrived this day he brought news of a very different nature from that which i had learned at saida on the preceding thursday ibrahim pasha had been defeated by the insurgents and had retreated as far as zali a burg overlooking the baka on the northeast slope of Mount Lebanon. In consequence of this, the road from Dair el Kamar to Damascus was too dangerous to pass, and all the muleteers were stopped at those two places, afraid to cross the intervening plain. I was surprised in the evening, when conversing with her ladyship, to see how the strongest minds are borne into the regions of fancy by what, with people of common sense, would be considered as mere visionary absurdities. I believe I have related elsewhere how a person, having gained the confidence of Lady Hester, told her he knew of a book that foretold the destinies of persons, which book he procured at her desire, and out of it offered to answer any questions she chose to put about anybody. I would not, said Lady Hester, when narrating the story, ask him what would happen in Syria, because I conceive the course of events may be predicted by a man of great sagacity in any country where he has cast a wistful eye on things passing around him but i fixed on you and asked him what is the doctor doing in europe the man opened his book and read and explained thus i see an elderly person sitting up in his bed and by the bedside a young woman kneeling whilst she entreats and implores the elderly person not to take some journey or go on some voyage which of the two he could not precisely say now doctor that you know was exactly the case for did not mrs m some one day cry and beg of you not to go and join me i am sure it was so i next asked him about myself he consulted his book and said i was to be witness to great battles or be near where they were fought, and that one of the contests would be so bloody that on one side not a person would be left to tell the story. This battle, moreover, was to be fought on a plain three miles long and three broad, near Zali, and upon Mount Lebanon. But, 
added Lady Hester. I never could find any solution to this prophecy until now. And the battle between Ibrahim Pasha and the insurgents clearly was the one meant. Neither could I discover where the plain was three miles long and three broad, and I sent people to the neighborhood of Zali. But nobody knew anything of such a place, until at last information was brought me that there existed a plain, as described in the heart of the mountain, like a basin, and which was shut out from the rest of the world. The book also said that a boy of royal blood would come from distant regions, would kiss my stirrup, and place himself under my guidance. All this was prophesied some years ago, and I always interpreted the bed scene as relating to Mrs. M. That came to pass, for, though you will not confess it, I am sure it was so. And now the other part has been fulfilled, too. In the course of the day, Lady Hester received a letter from Dr. Mill and Colonel Hazetta to say that their quarantine was over and that they would be at June on the 1st of July. Sunday, July 1st. They arrived early in the morning. After they had breakfasted, I received a note from Dr. Mill to say that he was about to read the morning prayers in his room and to invite me and any others so disposed to join him. These gentlemen remained two days, but a press of business prevented me from making memorandums. They always went together when Lady Hester sent word she was ready to receive them, and this vexed her a great deal. Dr. Mill's profound knowledge of languages— and his extensive reading had given her hopes that she might have cleared up some difficulties respecting Eastern history, and have discussed certain religious points about which she had not perfectly made up her mind. But Colonel Hazetta, who was a man of the world, and could take no part in abstruse subjects, was a barrier to such conversation. FRIDAY July 6th. Lady Hester was very low-spirited, and her cough troublesome. She was unable to converse, and I left her at ten in the evening. Ali, the messenger, had gone to Beirut two or three days before to carry the letter to Lord Palmerston and to await the arrival of the steamboat, which was expected. His delay in returning had created great despondency in her. And as the air was balmy and serene, and it was a moonlit night, I sat on my terrace, which overlooked the path by which Ali must pass, fondly hoping that he would make his appearance with the long-looked-for letter from Sir Francis Burdett. Presently I heard the dogs bark, and saw Freaky, the stoutest of our mastiffs, and generally the leader, rush towards the brow of the mountain which overlooked the valley through which Ali must come. Their barking grew fainter, and on a sudden ceased, and I then knew they had met someone belonging to the household. In about a quarter of an hour I recognized Ali, who, entering the gate, delivered his oilskin portfolio to me, and under a cover to myself from the French Chancellor, I found a packet for Lady Hester. I immediately sent it to her, and waited anxiously for the morning to learn what good news it brought. Saturday, July 7th. It was Sir Francis Burdett's long-expected long procrastinated answer, the delay of which caused so many wretched nights and days to poor Lady Hester, and prevented her from forming any settled plans. Alas, now that it was come, it proved very unsatisfactory. 
yet, notwithstanding, Lady Hester invented a thousand excuses for him. "'It is evident, doctor,' said she, "'that he could not write what he wanted to write. "'He wishes me all the happiness that a mortal can share, "'but says not a word that I did not know before. "'I have told you that Colonel Needham left Mr. Pitt "'a large property in Ireland by his will. "'But it so happened that Mr. Pitt died three days "'before Colonel Needham, and consequently the death of the legatee "'before the testator, in a legal point of view, "'put an end to the right. "'I knew that as well as he did, "'but that was not what I inquired about.' for when lord kilmery died to whom the property went i suppose that as it was originally intended for mr pitt he might have said as i have no children this may as well revert to where it was originally intended to go just as mrs coutts did not get her property from mr coutts but with the understanding that it was to be left afterwards to some of his grandchildren one time when lady b was so odd in her conduct mr c had some thoughts of making his grandson his heir and asked me to get him created lord c but the pride of lord bute and other reasons prevented this and of chapter 8, part 3. Chapter 8, part 4 of Memoirs of the Lady Hester Stanhope, volume 3, by Lady Hester Stanhope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 8, part 4. She went on. I dare say... Sir Francis was puzzled how to act. He was afraid, some of my relations would say, what business have you to interfere in family affairs? And so perhaps, thinking he might get into a duel or some unpleasant business, he writes in an evasive manner. But never mind. When the correspondence gets into the newspapers, "'Somebody will be found somewhere who will know something about the matter. "'Why, doctor, when Mr. Pitt died, "'there were people from the bank who came to tell me of the money he had there "'and advised me to take it. "'They came twice. "'I suppose it was money somebody had put in for him. "'But how Sir Nathaniel Raxall could ever get into his head?' that Lord C. lent him any, I can't imagine. A man who was so stingy that nothing ever was like it. No, when Mr. Pitt went out of office, six great men subscribed a sum to pay his debts, but Lord C. was not one of them. Sunday, July 8th. Today was marked by a little fright not uncommon in these countries. Mrs. M. was reading the morning service with the children, when, on looking up, she observed, outside of the window, which was open, an immense number of sparrows making sharp cries, fluttering about the terrace, and hovering round some object, which she immediately perceived to be the body of a huge serpent, hanging in one coil from the rafters of the terrace and suspended by the head and the tail. Said Ahmed, the porter, or Blackbeard, as he was usually called from that large jet-black appendage to his chin, was known to be a deadly enemy to serpents and my wife had the presence of mind to say to one of the children, steal gently out of the door, without alarming the serpent, and run and call Blackbeard here directly, telling him what he is wanted for, that he may bring some weapon with him. John did as he was bid, and not finding him in the lodge, called the first servant he saw. No less than seven ran together, 
and the cook, who had seized the porter's blunderbuss, which was kept ready loaded on a peg, advanced to where the serpent was yet hanging precisely in the same position, aimed at it, and shot it through the body. The serpent fell and was soon killed by blows from the bludgeons of the others. It proved on measurement to be seven feet and a half long. Its color was dark brown, somewhat mottled along the back, and gray under the belly. It was the largest, excepting the boa constrictor exhibited by T. Gully, that I had ever seen. The alarm excited by this enormous reptile was scarcely over, when two or three hours after sunset a man was seen crouching under the garden wall about two hundred yards from the house, and my family, who supposed it was a deserter or a robber concealing himself for some wicked purpose, informed me of it. But as the dogs did not bark, I knew he must be one of the people come there to receive stolen goods from the maids. Probably he saw he was observed, for he made off through the vines which grew thickly round the place. News was brought that Ibrahim Pasha had enticed the insurgents into the plain, attacked them at a village called Yanta near the Baka, and killed and wounded nearly a thousand men. For the Druzes had no artillery, and being undisciplined were no match for regular troops in an open country. The Emir Bashir, in the meantime, although it was said that he had been repeatedly summoned to take the field, was either unwilling or afraid to stir from his palace. I read out of Raxall's memoirs a page or two, which set Lady Hester talking in her usual way about old times. She related several anecdotes of the last Lord Chatham, of Lord Camden, of Lord Harrington, and of her father, but I forbear repeating them. I dare say, said she, I have seen Sir Nathaniel when he dined at Mr. Pitt's, but there came so many of them, one after another, rap, tap, tap, rap, tap, tap, and as soon as the last entered, dinner was served immediately. I could not know everybody. If I had known him, I would have made him a peer. He writes so well and his opinions and remarks are so just. I don't agree with him in one thing. The late Lord Chatham was not exactly like his father. His nose was more pointed, and my grandfather's was thicker in the bone towards the top, and with more of a bump. When Lady Hester assumed the Turkish dress, she had her head shaved as it is not possible to wear the red fez and a turban in any comfort with the hair on. The conversation led her to speak of heads, when, on a sudden, she pulled off her turban, fez and all, and told me to examine her skull. Having no precise knowledge of phrenology, I could only make very general observations but the examination, no doubt, would have been an excellent study for a craniologist. The frontal bone certainly was prominent, but with this exception, and a marked cavity in the temporal bones, the skull was remarkably smooth in carrying the hand over it, and pleasing to the eye from its perfect form. Perfect, as we should say, of a cupola that crowned an edifice with admirable proportions. She asked me, laughing, if I could see the thieving propensity strongly marked. Then, she said, I don't think there are any improprieties, do say. People, she added, have told me the fighting bump is as big as a lion's. 
I felt it, but it did not correspond with the assertion. The general appearance was this. Her head was somewhat small, her features somewhat long. Her ear was by no means handsome, being rather large and the convolutions of it irregular. After she had put her turban on again, she observed, It is an erroneous opinion that a big head always denotes much sense. I knew a countess who put her husband to the blush by her ignorance every day of her life. She would read and pore over a book and order to get ready something learned to say at dinner time, and yet was sure to make some blunder. Thus, for example, she would be talking of a sea fight and then go to ancient history and say something of the Battle of Actium, where Scipio Africanus distinguished himself. No, my dear, the husband would say. You don't mean, Scipio, you forget, and so on. Well, this countess, I recollect, seeing at Dobry's, the hatter in Bond Street. He made the best beavers of any man in London, and generally charged half a guinea more than anybody else. But he was terribly impudent. She was trying on a beaver, the largest in the shop, and it would not fit her. And she was saying she must have it made larger when Dobry gave it a blow with his measure and knocked it off the counter, saying, Ma'am, why do you think I make hats half a yard in diameter? There ought to be no head that their hat won't fit. Her head was enormous, doctor, spreading out all round here. And Lady Hester put the forefinger and thumb of each hand in a semicircle to each temple. So she was a pretty good proof that big heads have no memory. Your head is the same, and you have no memory whatever. Were you always so from a boy? Now I have reflected, and there was Mr. Coutts. He had a small head, but what a memory, and what sharpness and intelligence. Mr. Fox's was small in proportion to his face. Mr. Pitt's was neither small nor large. Lord Chatham, my grandfather's, was large. The fact is, as it appears to me, that size has nothing to do with it, but all depends on the building of the skull, just as in the making of a cupola or a dome, if the hemisphere is constructed in a proper way, it will render an echo. And if any error is made in the arch, sound is no longer propagated in it. So a skull, formed in a certain way, with the brain lodged in it, seems to give just echoes to the senses, and to form what is called a good understanding. All depends on construction, not size. And a little head, well made, will have twenty times the sense of a great one badly built. Monday, July 9th. I went to Sida. On my way, I passed a man on foot, raggedly dressed, evidently weary with walking, and come from a distance. The walking groom who was with me loitered behind, and a recognition seemed to take place between them. They talked together for about a quarter of an hour, and then the groom resumed his station. "'Do you know that poor wretch?' said I. "'Where does he come from?' "'He is a sort of kinsman of mine,' replied the lad. "'For he was once a farrier's boy like myself, and we are both nicknamed El Biatar. "'He has just come from Damascus or thereabouts.' How, said I, I thought the road was impassable. So it is, quoth the groom. But he was not fool enough, I dare say, to come by the road. There are plenty of bypaths across the country. 
Is there no news of the Pasha and the Druzes? asked I. Hm, said the groom. He does not dare to tell me if there is. But what he has let out is pretty much what was known already. A battle has been fought at Yanta, and things go badly. That night, on returning to the Dar, I was much surprised to see the same pauper sitting on the mustaby in front of the porter's lodge. Logmoggy was smoking his narkeely, and seeing me stare at the man, observed, with a quiet air, "'Here is a pretty fellow come to offer himself as a cook. But I think he would hardly make a scullion. However, I suppose I must mention it to her felicity the seat. I immediately guessed the matter. He had been sent as a spy to the camp. This was Lady Hester's way. Her ladyship had now made up her mind to execute her threat of walling up her gateway. "'You can be no longer of any use to me,' said she to me, "'and therefore had better go as soon as you can, before the bad weather comes on. As for my health, I am as well, I dare say, as I shall be and nothing that I can take of you European doctors will make me better. So don't fidget yourself on my account. All that remains to do now is to fill up the few days you have left in doing some necessary things for me. Let me see. I must write to the Duke Maximilian, to Count Wilsonsheim, and you too had better write to him, or to the baron that they might not think you left me unprotected, for you know how apt people are to put bad constructions on everything. And then there must be a letter to Prince Puckler Miscow, and one to Sir Francis Burdett, besides a short one to Mr. Moore. And then you must pay the servants and send them away. But that we will talk about afterwards." I shall keep none but the two boys, a man to fetch water, the gardener, and the girls. But you had better go to Sida and see about a vessel for carrying you to Cyprus. I should not like you to sail from Beirut, for those people will be only bothering you about my debts, and at present there is nothing to be said but what has been said already." You must send, too, for a mason to come and wall up the gateway. Tuesday, July 10th. I did not go to Sida to see about a boat, for I was resolved not to leave Lady Hester unless she insisted on it. The morning was employed in writing the following letter to the Duke Maximilian. June, July 10th. 1838. My Lord Duke, as the period of my sufferings and humiliation is not yet over, it would be unseemly in me to draw upon myself such an honor as you intend me in sending your Royal Highness's portrait. If it is a proof of your friendship for me, as I flatter myself in believing it to be, Allow me, by the same title, to ask a favor of you, which I hope you will not consider too bold. At no distant time the world will be convulsed with extraordinary phenomena and horrible scourges, which will bring about changes in everything. It is then that I ask permission to address your royal highness with that freedom I am known for, without fear of displeasing you. Ideas bought by painful experience, and knowledge picked up on a path covered with thorns, may perhaps, at a crisis which will be without example, prove useful to your royal highness." I will not recall the painful recollection of a moment 
when a high fever obliged me to sacrifice the honor and pleasure of making your personal acquaintance. Be pleased, my lord duke, to accept the assurance of my highest consideration and esteem, and my prayers that your royal highness will soon be restored to the bosom of your family. Hester Lucy Stanhope I send my cordial salutations to your royal highness's suite. End of chapter 8CHAPTER Nine, PART One OF MEMOIRS OF THE LADY HESTER STANHOPE, VOLUME THREE, BY LADY HESTER STANHOPE. THIS LIBRIVOX RECORDING IS IN THE PUBLIC DOMAIN. CHAPTER Nine, PART One. MONDAY, JULY 16TH. I WENT TO Beirut TO SEE MONSIEUR JORELL, THE CHANCELLOR AND CHIEF INTERPRETER OF THE FRENCH CONSULATE whose lady has inspired the pen of M. Lamartine in some beautiful lines to be found in his Souvenir de l'Orient. In order to make the necessary arrangements for Lady Hester's letters, should any come, and to acquaint him and others with her extraordinary resolution to immure herself. I executed her orders, and delivered her message punctually. But I must say, I did not believe she would put such a determination into execution. However, I was much deceived, for on my return to June, I found she had already employed Logmoggy to hire a boat to convey me and my family to Cyprus, seeing I took no steps to do so myself. Now, therefore, that her mind was made up, and knowing that when that was the case nothing on earth could shake her resolution, I employed the short space that remained in setting her house in order, in writing her letters, and in taking her instructions for such things as would be useful to her in Europe. I rode down to Saida to see the vessel which had been hired. It was a small schooner of Castel Rosso, with a Greek crew, the most cutthroat-looking dogs I ever beheld. The passage money had been agreed for by Logmoggy at one thousand piastres for a run of one hundred miles a round sum of money for the distance in that country where a single passenger often goes across in a trading vessel for two piastres or about ten pence english the captain accompanied me to m conti's the french agent where an agreement was drawn up that he was to remain in waiting fifteen days at the expiration of which time I, if not ready to sail, was to pay him thirty piastres a day for as many days as he was kept over his time. The sinister looks of the captain made me almost afraid to close a bargain with him. He had eyes protruding from their sockets so far that when he was arguing about the price of the passage, they stood out just as if the cavity of the skull had been puffed up with wind. And Lady Hester had, on some occasion, told me that was a sign of a murderer. I recollected, too, that it was in just such a schooner, a few years before, four or five Europeans had been murdered and thrown overboard, in a passage from Syria to Cyprus. And, coupling these circumstances together, I felt uneasy. It is true the man was known to Monsieur Conti as having once brought a freight of deals to Saida, but only once. Logmoggy, too, assured me he had frequented his house at Castel Rosso, and I was aware that if I expressed any apprehensions to Lady Hester Stanhope, she would call them frivolous. 
I therefore signed the paper, and it was left to be registered in the chancery, for which the fees charged to the captain, as he told me afterwards, were some thirty or forty piastres. I was so far right in my conjectures about the captain's murdering propensities that when we were on our passage, he related a story of his having been one of the crew of a vessel which took a Turkish ship, every one of which was butchered in cold blood. My family was made acquainted with what I had done, and the business of packing began on the morrow. The following days I was by Lady Hester's bedside from three to five hours every morning, and after dinner in the saloon with her from eight or half-past eight until twelve, one or two o'clock. She repeated over again many of her stories with a view of impressing them, as I suppose, on my memory for having told her one day that if she would give herself the trouble of writing her memoirs, she might pay her debts from the sale of such a work. She only laughed and said, Ah, oh, well, when I get better, I shall tell you a few more anecdotes to make a book of, since you think it would be so profitable. And whenever, after dictating a letter, I wrote it out fairly and gave the foul copy together with the fair one to her. She would take the latter and say, You may keep the other. Or if she had reasons for wishing the contents to remain a secret, she would take them both and put them by in her portfolio, and then I heard no more of the foul copy. It was thus she sometimes told me Eastern stories, after I had made some accidental observations on the charm that these little stories seemed to possess for European readers, as was manifested in the praises bestowed on those in M. Lamartine's work. Had her health been good, and had the course of events gone on peaceably, I am inclined to think she would have listened to my suggestion and have dictated her memoirs to me. On some occasions, it was her custom to say, Now, don't go and write that down. On others, You have kept no copy of such and such a letter of mine, and You have destroyed such a paper. Give me your word. When I was obliged to answer, categorically. I was at last worn out with fatigue from long sittings and these various occupations, not the least of which was to put her affairs in such order that when she shut herself up she should be in want of nothing, have nothing to pay, nothing to write, meet with no interruptions to her seclusion, and be dead to the world." All this I did as far as I was able. July 20th. Lady Hester dictated the following letter to Sir Francis Burdett, an answer to the one she had received on the 6th Ultimo. Lady Hester Stanhope to Sir Francis Burdett, Baronet. June, July 20th, 1838. My dear Burdette, I am no fool, neither are you. But you might pass for one, if in good earnest you did not understand my letter. You tell me what is self-evident, that I have no right to inherit Colonel Needham's property, etc. Neither had your daughter any right to inherit Mr. Cowett's property. But in all probability, his wife being aware that you and your family stood high in his estimation, paid that compliment to his memory. Lord Kilmory, who had no children, being aware of General Needham's partiality towards Mr. Pitt, might, by his will, have allowed the property to return to the remaining branch of the Pitt family. 
Do not be afraid that I am going to give you any fresh trouble about this affair, notwithstanding I believe that you were some time hatching this stupid answer. But I do not owe you any grudge, as I know that it does not come from you. I know where it comes from. A lion of the desert, being caught in the huntsman's nap, called in vain to the beasts of the field to assist him, and received from them about as shuffling an answer as I have received from you, and previously from Lord H. A little field mouse gnawed the master knot, and called to the lion to make a great effort which burst the noose, and out came the lion stronger than ever. I am now about building up every avenue to my premises, and there shall wait with patience, immured within the walls, till it please God to send me a little mouse, and whoever presumes to force my retirement by scaling my walls or anything of the like will be received by me as Lord Camelford would have received them. Hester Lucy Stanhope Tuesday, July 24th. Her ladyship dictated another letter to Count Wilsonsheim. It was written in French, like all those addressed to foreigners, but which have all been given translated. For the style of Lady Hester's French was composed of anglicisms, and in turning them into her native tongue, the very expressions which she would have used seemed naturally to present themselves. Lady Hester Stanhope, to Count Wilsonsheim, Chamberlain to His Imperial Majesty, etc., etc., June, June 24th, 1838. Sir Count, I have delayed answering your amiable letter until I thought your voyage was over. I am happy that His Royal Highness quitted this country when he did. Not because of the plague, the season was gone by this year for that, but because of the aspect of affairs, and of the Druze insurrection, which has grown considerably hotter, and which would have made it impossible to travel with any comfort. Ibrahim Pasha began the war in the Haran with forty-five thousand men. The Druzes had but seven thousand, assisted by some tribes of the Arabs of the desert. Ibrahim Pasha has lost thirty thousand between Nizam troops, as they are called, Sugmans and Albanians, without reckoning the wounded. The Druze army, I believe, does not at present exceed 2,500 men, but each man of that 2,500 is singly worth 20. The last seat of the war was about 14 leagues distant in a straight line from my residence. The Druzes, after having well beaten Ibrahim Pasha and killed some of his officers, retreated to the Haran, pursued by the Pasha. You no doubt are aware that His Highness the Pasha, in concert with the Emir Bashir, disarmed the Druzes some time ago by a stratagem which gave the government means to take their sons as conscripts for the Nizam. After that, they, in like manner, disarmed the Christians. But necessity has compelled the Pasha lately to give them their arms again, in order to enable the son of the Emir Bashir to join the Pasha's forces with a reinforcement of Christians, which he stood in need of to garrison the skirts of the mountain on the side of the Baka. The Druzes killed a great many of these Christians, and they could have annihilated them. But they said to them, You are not to blame. 
it goes against us to exterminate you, for we have always lived with you on friendly terms. But we will slay without pity every Christian we find in arms, excepting those of the mountain. The French government has done an imprudent thing in removing Mr. Consul Guy from his post at Beirut, because that gentleman had very extensive connections amongst the bishops and priests, and all the numerous sects of Christians found on Mount Lebanon, and by his information and experience had means of giving them good advice. For if by chance those Christians gave heed to bad counsel, it might not be impossible that half the Franks who inhabit this country would be massacred by the Nablusians, the Druzes, the Ansareas, the Ishmaelites, the Shemsias, the Kelbias, and the Kords in general, who occupy the country between Mount Lebanon and Aleppo on the side of Gebel el Sigon, not far from Antioch. As I know how to speak no language but that of the Orientals, you will forgive me, Sir Count, if I call you the Pope's Grand Vizier. It devolves, therefore, on you to think of a way to make Monsieur Guy return to the post which he has just quitted, a thing, in my opinion, very necessary both for the safety of the country and of the Europeans in it. I have a great esteem for Monsieur Guy, but I see him so seldom, that whether he is far or near, it is pretty much the same to me. As for the Christians here, I do not interest myself more about them than about other men, perhaps less, not on account of their religion, but of their qualities, of which egotism and perfidy are marked characteristics in most of them. As a religion is with me neither more nor less than a costume of adoration, it is all one whether it is green, white, blue, or black. To me, it is all the same whether a man prostrates himself before a piece of wood or before a cockle shell, as the Metulis do, provided his heart addresses itself to the Almighty. Perhaps, for saying this, you will have me crucified by the Pope. Never mind, if it is my lot, I shall not repine, since whatever is decreed must necessarily happen. But it is not necessary, for all that, by a want of policy, to make civil wars break out, which would do no good to anybody, and which would not turn to any account, even for those who stirred them up. Neither is it proper to remove those to a distance who have the means of pacifying the disputants should the case require it. If I had had the happiness of seeing you, I would have asked you if you had ever seen the prophecy of a certain pope whose leaden coffin was found about seventy years ago. That prophecy has great analogy with some oriental ones. Esther Lucy Stanhope End of chapter 9, part 1Chapter 9, Part 2 of the Memoirs of the Lady Hester Stanhope, Volume 3, by Lady Hester Stanhope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 9, Part 2 Lady Hester wished me also to write to the Count, to let him know how it happened, that Prince Pockler Miscow had been entrusted with the correspondence between herself, Lord Palmerston, his grace the Duke of Wellington, etc., etc., and also, as much had been said of the prince's way of travelling at the expense of Mohammed Ali Pasha, to assure him, the Count, 
that the prince showed no signs of stinginess when at June. The next day, being Wednesday, when I could not see Lady Hester, I executed her wish. Dr. M. to Count Wilsonsheim, June, July 25th, 1838. Sir Count, as you appear to take a lively interest in whatever regards Lady Hester Stanhope, I hope on that account you will excuse me if I join to her ladyship's letter a few words from myself to place in their true light some circumstances which might otherwise appear extraordinary to you. In consequence of the proceedings instituted against her ladyship by the English government, Lady Hester has resolved to shut herself up in her house, to wall up the entrance, and to bury herself, as one would say, in a tomb, until those who have attempted to cast a stain on her integrity, the rightful inheritance, as she affirms, of the Pitt family, shall, by a signal reparation, have washed it out. She is in the act of reducing her establishment to her strict wants by discharging her servants. I myself am on the point of my departure for Europe, forced by her ladyship to go, but deeply regretting that I must leave her without a single European near her person, and without a single servant in whom she has confidence. My uneasiness, however, does not extend so far as to fear for her personal safety, although the war between the Druzes and the Pasha rages more fiercely than ever because I know the firmness and intrepidity of her character, the resources of her mind, and the respect and dread in which the two hostile parties hold her. It is probable that her ladyship's grievances will find their way into the public papers, for Prince Puckler Miscow, when on his visit here, was so struck with the indignities of which she continued to be the victim that he was resolved to give some true details of it to the public. Her ladyship had found in him a man at once intelligent and kind, ready indeed to offer her his assistance to a greater extent than she was willing to accept in everything relative to her affairs. It is very extraordinary that at that time Lady Hester knew nothing of the avarice imputed to him, of which it was impossible she could have the least suspicion. For his stay at her house was marked by a degree of liberality in everything befitting a prince, and absolutely at variance with the reports spread about him in the places through which he has passed. Reports which astonished her ladyship as much as they did me, since nothing of the kind was seen here. Thank God I leave her in better health, and lively as always, just as if nothing had happened. I have the honor to be, Sir Count, your most obedient, humble servant. Sunday, July 29th. The last letter which Lady Hester wrote before I left her was the following, to Charles Baron de Boussac, June, July twenty ninth, 1838. Sir Baron, mortified as I was that circumstances prevented me from felicitating you in person on the re-establishment of your health, I am nevertheless rejoiced that you all hasten to quit Syria, seeing that the warfare between Ibrahim Pasha and the Druzes has become exceeding rancorous, and would have made traveling through the country far from agreeable. The scene of action has lately been at Rashea, where the Druzes have performed miracles. The emir Bashir's son, 
marched with a reinforcement to assist Ibrahim Pasha, and of this the Druzes killed just enough in the twinkling of an eye to convince the whole body that if they, the Druzes, had not chosen to recollect they were fighting with neighbors, they could have exterminated them. The emir's son had his horse killed under him, and that prince took refuge very quickly in the mountain. When the Druzes found out that the Pasha's artillery in the valleys cut them up dreadfully, and that personal courage was of no value, they retreated to the Huron, where the inequality of the ground was more favorable to them. At this moment, Ibrahim Pasha is in pursuit of them, and has given orders to his Bedouin robbers, whom he brought from Egypt, a tribe which is called the Hanadi, to run down the greatest hero the Druzes have got, and to bring him alive. Being so struck with the courage of the man that he would willingly employ him in his own service. Poor Pasha. I fancy he has made a bad calculation in thinking that one of the family of Ariane, men accustomed like their ancestors to rule with sovereign authority in their castle at Gendal, would ever become a vile slave to save his wife. Shibli el Ariane is not only a hero in battle, but a Demosthenes in council. He makes even the great tremble by the language he holds. An order has just been issued by the Amir Bashir to search the dwellings of the Druzes afresh for concealed arms, and to take from them their horses. This is, at best, a great piece of imprudence, because seeing that many of the cavaliers would sooner fly than give up their horses, he will thus increase the number of insurgents in the Horan. Ibrahim Pasha, with the wreck of his army, of which he has lost full thirty thousand without counting the wounded, cannot if he does not soon make peace and come to some composition, do much more with the Druzes. This is the state of affairs at this present moment, but it is difficult to get at the truth. Even your friend Al, if he knows anything, dares not avow it. But what such sort of people know is so little, their information is so confined, they are all so ignorant of the true character of the projects and of the resources of the different races that inhabit Syria that the reasonings they make are about as false as a fairy tale. I have the honor to be, Sir Baron, with all esteem and consideration, yours, H. L. Stanhope. Monday July 30th. The mason had been sent for from Sida, and stones and materials had been collected for walling up the gateway. Lady Hester drew out on paper the exact manner in which she wished it to be done. It was a screen which completely masked the gateway and left a side opening just large enough for a cow or an ass laden with water to enter. I superintended this work of self-inhumation, the like of which never entered woman's mind before. It was an affair of two days, Monday and Tuesday. Tuesday, July 31st. Today I spoke to Lady Hester medically for the last time. Her pulse had recovered much of its wonted strength, and although there were periods when she coughed violently, still the struggles of a naturally good constitution and powerful lungs had enabled her to hold out against the most formidable attack of pulmonary catarrh 
that I had ever seen a human being withstand. Thursday, August 2nd. As no letters came from Prince Puckler Moscow, and as it was evident some reason had prevented him from fulfilling his promise of publishing Lady Hester's correspondence, she now gave me her final instructions on that head. I am disposed to believe it was the strong desire that possessed her to ensure the publication of her letters in the newspapers, which, amidst much hesitation and wavering, made her decide on my departure. For she knew she could rely on me, and the publicity of her grievances now seemed to be the paramount object in her thoughts. Her anxiety on this point was so great that lest any accident might happen to the M.S. by shipwreck or otherwise, she had a second copy made of the whole correspondence, which was to be left with her whilst I retained the originals. Her own conviction was that her constitution was invulnerable. She thought she should yet live to see her enemies confounded, the sultan triumphant, her debts paid, and an ample income at her disposal. She dwelt with the same apparent confidence as ever on the approaching advent of the Mehedi, and still looked on her mare, Leela, as destined to bear him with herself on Lulu by his side. "'I shall not die in my bed,' she would say, and I had rather not. My brother did not, and I have always had a feeling that my end would be in blood. That does not frighten me in the least. From August the 1st until the 6th, I was too much employed to take notes. On the 4th, the 15 days agreed on with the captain were at an end, and he became importunate for our departure. But now that the moment of separation had arrived, Lady Hester had some misgivings, and seemed to wish to defer it. I accordingly paid a first day's forfeit, then a second, then a third. At last, however, on Monday, August the 6th, 1838, I took an affectionate leave of her, and never saw her more. On quitting her, I said, it is better that I should not see you tomorrow, even though I should not set off early. You do right, she replied. Let this be our parting. But you have no money, I observed. How will you do for your current expenses? It's true, she answered. I must thank you to lend me two thousand piastres before you go, and I'll repay you as soon as I can. Send them in by Ibrahim. He's an honest lad, and even if he knew it was money, would not touch it. But, however, you had better put two or three things of no value in a little basket, and a cup and saucer, or something that weighs— as if you sent them for my use, and then the gold will lie underneath unsuspected. This was done, and I would have sent more, for I had twice as much more by me, but when I proposed to do so, her ladyship objected, remarking, You may be blown out of your course, and be obliged to remain days and days at some port where you may want it for the necessaries of life. Two thousand will do, and if I want more, Log Moggy, I am sure, will raise me as much. August 7th. It was eleven in the day before we could get everything ready. As we quitted the terrace, where we had passed nearly fifteen months, my wife and daughter shed tears. The black girl, Zezafoon, was seen looking after us from the garden wall, where she or the other maids had kept watch from the dawn. 
Our servants walked by our side to Sida, and the secretary accompanied us. When we were about two miles on the road, a servant was descried running after us. My heart beat. I knew not what might have happened. But his business was merely to deliver a bag he had on his shoulders, in which was a small turkey carpet for spreading on the cabin floor in the vessel. This Lady Hester had sent, with a message that perhaps we might find it serviceable in the passage. Even to the last moment did her kind consideration for our comforts manifest itself. We embarked under the escort of Logmoggy, amidst a crowd of persons who had collected on the strand. On board we found the entire hold neatly partitioned off by mats, which had been done by Logmoggy's care, and mats spread on the ballast, so that we had spacious and convenient berths for all the party. The schooner was fur-built and quite new. Whether this was the reason that she abounded in cockroaches, I know not, or whether it was the extreme heat or her cargo that had introduced them. But there were thousands and thousands crawling in every direction, and this annoyance added to the burning sun made the passage far from pleasant. Our captain was named Kiriako Candaviti, and the vessel the Thrasyllabus. On Friday at sunset we anchored in Cyprus Roads, and on Saturday morning were received on the seashore by our excellent and generous friend, Signor Baldassari Matei, at the door of his marine villa, into which he ushered us, and in the true spirit of Eastern hospitality, made himself our guest, and insisted on it that we were from that moment in our own mansion. It was the same house we inhabited in 1832. We remained in Cyprus three weeks, delighted with the kindness of the Europeans and natives, and reveling in the abundance for which that happy island is so famous. We were luxuriously supplied with sweet and water melons, grapes, figs, pomegranates, and other fruits, of a flavor and size passing belief. Partridges were two and a half pennies each, hares at six pennies, a loaf of bread the size of a quart basin at one and a half pennies, mutton at two pennies a pound, a fine hen for five pennies, and so in proportion of other things, with the exception of fish, which was rather dear. Finding here the same vessel that had carried us to Europe in 1832, and still commanded by the same master, we took our passage by her for one thousand francs board included, and on the 30th of August set sail. Our voyage was prosperous, and reaching the port of Marseilles on the 7th of October, we disembarked on the 8th in the afternoon, and entered the lazaretto, where we performed quarantine for fifteen days. Then, resting ourselves for a week in a hotel at Marseilles, during which time I transmitted a copy of the correspondence to England to be inserted in the newspapers, and leaving Miss Longchamps with her friends, we betook ourselves to Nice, where we arrived on the 2nd of November, having been absent a little more than seventeen months. In mentioning the name of Mademoiselle Longchamps for the last time, I must, even at the risk of offending her extreme delicacy, bear testimony to her amiable cheerfulness of character under all our difficulties, to her rare conversational powers, her exemplary but unobtrusive piety, 
and those numberless good qualities which a close acquaintance under trying circumstances gave us such peculiar opportunities of discovering. End of chapter 9, part 2「Nine, Part Three of Memoirs of the Lady Hester Stanhope, Volume Three by Lady Hester Stanhope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Nine, Part Three. After my arrival at Nice, I received letters from Lady Hester about once a month up to the time of her death. The first was dated. September 30th, 1838. Dear Doctor, I cannot answer tonight the letters I have just received from you from Cyprus, but must say two words to clear up what to anybody but yourself would appear but too extraordinary. The messenger sent by Monsieur Jurel arrived at the moment my dinner was set before me, I looked at the direction of the letters and gave them to Zezafoon to put by in the same room until I had dined. When I wanted them, one of yours was not to be found, and she turned the room upside down, always with her usual impudence, asking if she ate letters, etc. You know what beasts they all are. I cannot be lost, but where she has stuffed it, God knows. Yesterday she lost a piece of fine cloth in the same way, which is not yet found. Tomorrow something else. You know them but too well, and also their impudent conduct when they find they are in the wrong. The prince is gone to Europe. I hope soon to hear of your safe arrival in France, and I shall write to you by the next vapor. Yours sincerely, H. L. Stanhope. Lady Hester Stanhope to Dr. M. June, October 22nd, 1838. Dear Doctor, I hope soon to hear of your safe arrival at Marseilles, and take the first opportunity of repaying you the two thousand piastres for the loan of which I am very much obliged to you. I enclose a bill on counts for fifty pounds, twenty for you, and thirty for commissions. What I immediately want, and supposing you are at Nice, if procured by your friend, Captain Pardot, will be better, as he understands these things, is some dried cherries and burgundy apricots, simply dried like raisins, if such are to be had at Marseilles, eight or ten pounds of each, small covered pans for milk, three wire blinds for the milk room, fine that flies cannot enter, each three spans square, or about half an ell, some wire covers for the milk pans, pots and jugs of different sizes, a supply of yellow and red earthenware. I forgot to ask you when you were here if there were kettles in iron like tin ones and coffee pots for they would be of great use, as tin is destroyed in a day, and a large boiler would stand better on the fire than a tin kettle, for always, I mean, and better for my kitchen. Better also for the milk boy to wash up his pots and pans. I want, too, some iron spoons and some wooden ladles and skimmers. I should like to have Miss Pardot's book on Constantinople if it has come out for strangers. For I fear I never could get through with it myself, no more than the others you have sent me. But I must trust to chance. This just puts me in mind that one of the books I should like to have would be Graham's Domestic Medicine. A good red book, peerage, I mean, 
and the book about the Prince of Wales, George the Fourth. I have found out a person who can occasionally read French to me. So, if there was any very pleasing French book, you might send it. But no Bonapartes, etc., or present times, and a little brochure or two upon baking, pastry, gardening, etc., some haricot seeds, and also dahlias of different colors. Are there no iron candlesticks for lamps for the servants to work by at night? For my new people shall work like other servants. Besides, in out-of-door rooms there are no lamps to see by, and those thick glass globes with two or three burners would be useful. Add also some inkstands of thick glass with a tray of tin or japan like a coffee tray. I should think it right of you to send a line of certificate to Lord H. in case he should want it, just saying, I have had a letter from Lady Hester Stanhope in which she requests me to give your lordship, in writing, my opinion of her health, etc. Then the essence of the said certificate to be, if you think so, that having known Lady Hester nearly thirty years, I can safely say that I never have yet seen such a constitution, that the most severe illnesses often have not appeared to attack or impair the stamina of it, that, etc., etc. I have had a very kind letter from the Prince, Pockler Mescow. He has gone to Europe or at least is on his way. His slaves, etc., went by Leghorn. He says there were difficulties respecting the Queen's letter in Germany, but he has another plan. He desires to be kindly remembered to you. If I inquire about your health, or that of your family, it will be in my own way with interest and perhaps giving some opinion, which, as usual, may be taken ill. So I shall say nothing, either now or hereafter, on that subject. I strained my eyes to write a long letter, now before me, about your complaint on the chest. But I shall burn it. Everybody is laid up here. Logmoggy, with a bad fever as also Mustafa and the cowboy. Mohammed, with a fit of the gout, unable to walk or stir. Fatoum, half with whims, always under the coverlet. Zezafoon ill, but keeping to her work. The early rain has caused illness everywhere. Arian's troops, being so diminished, and his resources failing, owing to want of assistance from the other Druzes, who hung back after Ibrahim Pasha's declaration that he would burn all Druze property in the mountain, he has surrendered, they say, severely wounded by the Arabs of his party for being a traitor in their eyes. Affairs are, therefore, a little quiet in that quarter for the present, but towards Aleppo, the Kurds and Turkmens are very troublesome, and every one seems alarmed. Corn has risen to a terrible price, and barley there is none, though some, they say, has been brought to Beirut. Twenty-five thousand purses have been found with the cheating Yazjis who are in a sad position." Four or five hundred families will be implicated in this business and ruined by their want of honesty. The mountain is in a very disturbed state, but my habitation is well walled in and the weight of all on poor me. For Logmagi is at Sida, no letters from England. So far till today... Afterwards, I shall not be able to give you any account of myself, 
as I suffer so by writing. The spectacles always cause me such a vast pain that I cannot stand it. And besides, it lasts all day, or next day. I was going to say, pray save your eyes, and do not read so much useless trash, but I forgot. I will never give you any more advice. Mr. M., who you did not see at Cyprus, has offered to serve me as secretary and to arrange my servants. He, living at his own expense at June or some other village, but as he refused all salary, I could not do otherwise than refuse his offer. This is my last long letter. Yours sincerely, H. L. S. P.S. The steamer is expected in two days. Perhaps it may bring news. Lady Hester Stanhope to Dr. M. June, February ninth, 1839. You need not tremble this time, my dear doctor, for I am not displeased with you. The Sir William Knighton is not worth looking into, and love is not amongst them. The book of medicine is clear and well written. I have to thank you for a vast deal of trouble you have given yourself. All, in the end, will turn out well, I hope. I have written a few lines in answer to the morning chronicle, which you will afterwards see in Galignani, without doubt. What a simpleton you are sometimes. Leave my systems to me, and adopt those of your own. But don't blame mine as you have done, without knowing the reason of them. Miss Pardo's book I have not yet looked into. The one you sent me is interesting only to those who were acquainted with the persons named. All mock taste, mock feeling, etc., but that is the fashion. I am this, I am that. Who ever talked such empty stuff formerly? I was never named by a well-bred person. There has been a vast deal of rain this year, but not very cold, the house nearly as usual. My cough continues, my spirits the same. A hyena came into the garden the other day, and Ibrahim Betar killed it with only a bludgeon and brought me the skin. It is the first wild beast of the kind that has been so daring this winter. The dogs frightened the animal so much on the outside that it scaled the wall. Let me know when you leave Nice. I should think England would be a very unpleasant séjour in the present state of affairs. Switzerland, perhaps, more healthy, cheaper, and more agreeable. Until you see distinctly the turn things take and my affairs settled. You do not mention your health, therefore, I hope it is not to be complained of at this moment. Shut up as I am... I can have no news. Advice you take ill and call it scolding. I am too much obliged to Captain Pardo for having undertaken my commissions. I have safely received the stockings you had the attention to send me. You must promise to state to me fairly the impression my affairs make with the English and what sort, what class of English. Ariane has been bribed, and is now raising a regiment of two thousand for Ibrahim Pasha. There will be hard work here ere long. It appears the Kirkubi uproar about money was certainly the disgusting examination into the private affairs of officers in the navy at the Admiralty, and of the army at the Horse Guards. It has disgusted everyone and roused a feeling about me. Not signed. Lady Hester Stanhope to Dr. M. June, March 11th, 1839. 
I send you something to get put into a newspaper. I think it is not bad. Some day I shall write a manifesto, which will be superb, and open people's eyes in all directions. I would have sent you Sir William Knighton's work, but I suppose you can get it where you are, and it would not amuse you. It speaks of nothing but commonplace things. He has kept only, or at least they have published only, formal letters, and which throw little light on anything. Miss Pardot is very excellent upon many subjects, only there is too much of what the English like stars, winds, black shades, soft sounds, etc. The Arabic story you ask me for I have already dictated to the prince. I know many others, but they are too long. Are you going to write a book? I believe your ears and eyes will be opened too late. You will then see, to your cost, that admonitions, called scoldings, were the highest compliment I could pay a man in your situation, by endeavouring to raise his mind to the altitude necessary to exist, one may say, in a wreck of worlds. If you were so uneasy at June, how will your nerves bear what you will be doomed to see? But when this time comes... No more advice from me to you or any one. Let all pick their way and abide by the consequences. Words are nothing. The hearts of men must be cleansed of all the vain, idle stuff they now cherish as a sort of safeguard or escape boat to evils of all kind. If the naked savage, who has the feelings of a man, is not in high favor with the Almighty and placed in a higher situation if he continues to do his duty than the educated my lord, the pedant, the gentleman, as it is called, without either conscience, talent, or money, I know nothing. And you may reproach me hereafter in the harshest possible terms. It is a very mean spirit which fears obligation. We are under obligations of the most serious nature every day to the horse, the ass, the cow, etc. All the stuff persons now call spirit are the vulgar ideas of the lowest and least philosophical of human beings. What should I think of my deserted self were I to constantly talk to Logmagi of obligation? I am proud to acknowledge all I owe to his zeal and obedience. End of chapter 9, part 3 Chapter 9, part 4 of Memoirs of the Lady Hester Stanhope, volume 3, by Lady Hester Stanhope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. CHAPTER Nine, PART Four. I am contented with the violence of my own character. It draws a line for me between friends and enemies. There is at this moment a great kerkerby, uproar or disturbance, seizing recruits for the Nizam, and entering by force into all sorts of houses to seek for arms. Will you see that I receive a dozen pair of spectacles like those you wear, six or seven of fine quality, and the others common black ones but with clear glasses, and a dozen like what I wear, not expensive? Always employ me if I can be useful to you here. I expect to hear from you. When do you think of leaving Nice? My affair will not finish quickly, I am afraid. Your friend you will get on. He is all information, energy, and talent. But the times are gone by for people to go the beaten track, and all is too late. 
in less than a year it is more than probable that the world will be at war the prophet general lustanu is most comfortable in his new habitation i have planted shrubs for him round the windows divided the room in two and made all new with an excellent sofa i must tell you a story about logmagi he was reproaching one of the mookers muleteers about some neglect of his duty only abusing him never touching him when the fellow ran and fetched his pistol which he presented at logmagi to shoot him logmagi with a wonderful presence of mind vulgar perhaps but every one in his way the mooker was a vulgar man turned into his face not his own face and said no honest man would meet a blackguard face to face that was his courage match the bystanders roared with laughter and the man ran away quickly by the steamer the spectacles seven pair of white ones long five others long too but like those you wear black and light no signature lady hester stanhope to dr m june may sixth eighteen thirty nine the vapour is expected in a few days i am much better but not yet well enough to make a little drawing necessary to explain something i want you to get done for me thank god for my nerves would you sleep alone in a room with this girl zezafoon and besides she told me the other day that she had only teeth for those who displeased her and therefore you see she is not ashamed of herself but i think no more of her than of a little babe and sleep on quietly all in the house have made wry faces after this affair even logmoggy who would not like to be bitten a second time i did not write to you before i had answered the morning chronicle for I fear that perhaps my letter to you might be read, and so spoil all. As yet, all things remain as before. What strange people! No answer from anyone. Not one Englishman has set his foot in Syria since this business. Someone, I suppose you, sent me the life of lord edward fitzgerald it is i who could give a true and most extraordinary history of all those transactions the book is all stuff the duchess lord edward's mother was my particular friend as was also his aunt i was intimate with all the family and knew that noted pamela all the books i see make me sick only catch penny nonsense a thousand thanks for the promise of my grandfather's letters but the book will all be spoilt by being edited by young men first they are totally ignorant of the politics of my grandfather's age secondly of the style of the language used at that period and absolutely ignorant of his secret reasons and intentions and the real or apparent footing he was upon with many people friends and foes i know all that from my grandmother who was his secretary and couch used to say the cleverest man of her time in politics business etc even the late lord chatham his son had but an imperfect idea of all that took place for he was either absent or when not so taken up by dissipation for no man was ever more admired or sought after pringle's father i suppose is dead and this is the son 
Harriet Elliot's son. At twenty, she married an officer, nearly fifty, I should think, but who was, I believe, a very honorable, respectable man. Do not keep reproaching yourself about leaving me. It did not depend on you to stay. Also, do not put into your head that you have the seeds of the malady you named to me. I hope to hear that you are better. H. L. S. I have written a sad, stupid letter, but I have no news. Shut up. This was the last letter I received from her ladyship. She died in June following Adaphos, Aklaftos, Aphios, Animineos. Everybody being in ignorance of her approaching end, except the servants immediately about her. She had no Frank or European near her, and Lunardi, who was coming out to her from Leghorn, reached Beirut, unfortunately too late. The news of her death was conveyed to Beirut in a few hours, and the English consul, Mr. Moore, and the Reverend Mr. Thompson, an American missionary, went to June to bury her. Her emaciated corpse was interred in the same grave where the body of Captain Lustanu had been placed some years before in her own garden. This was according to her desire expressed to Logmoggy before her death. Reports were spread that her furniture, plate, and other valuables had been plundered, and much stress was laid on the circumstance that not even her watch was found. But she had no watch, and only a dozen and a half of silver spoons and forks. Fatum, it is said, died two days before her mistress. I have now brought this melancholy, but I hope not uninteresting, narrative to a conclusion. Upon a review of the incidents detailed in these pages, the vicissitudes of an extraordinary life, beginning in pomp and power, and closing in pecuniary difficulties and neglect, the reader can scarcely fail to be touched with profound sympathy at the altered fortunes of a remarkable woman, even if nothing else in the history of Lady Hester Stanhope should awaken his emotions. No lady of her age and station ever underwent such afflicting changes. In early life, she enjoyed the entire confidence of her uncle, Mr. Pitt and many of the secret functions of government, most of the important measures of his administration, much of the patronage vested in the office which he filled, and the complete control of his domestic establishment, either passed through her hands or was directly influenced by her counsels. During this eventful period, her clear insight into human nature enabled her frequently to thwart the intrigues and expose the designs of interested men who swarmed about the avenues of the court and the cabinet. But it was not possible for one, endued with a courageous spirit and integrity like hers, to engage in such conspicuous scenes without exciting the bitterest animosities and accordingly we find that while she was openly hostile to some and maintained a less evident but persevering resistance to others dealing out affronts where she thought them likely to tell with effect or foiling subtle machinations on the one hand by counterplots artfully combined on the other she raised up a host of enemies for herself who only waited a fit opportunity to take their full revenge. In the assertion of that fearless rectitude which despises personal consequences, she overlooked the dangers which were growing up around her. 
forgetting, as is usual, in the delirium of power, the uncertainty of all human greatness, the wheel of fortune went round, and by the premature death of Mr. Pitt she was precipitated at once and irrevocably from the pinnacle of ambition into comparative obscurity, and was destined to wear out her existence in solitude and exile. But her virtues were sterling, and gave a sort of luster to her fall. She carried with her into exile, and in adversity, the same stern consistency and the same high principles which had all along regulated her conduct. Incapable of abasing herself by meanness, she was sustained in her reverses by the fortitude which she derived from a clear conscience. If in her exaltation she had been bold, proud, and uncompromising, she had likewise shown herself disinterested and generous, firm in her convictions, insensible to the allurements of flattery or wealth, just, self-devoted, an open foe, a grateful friend, and a kind and most affectionate relative. Qualities which ennoble even where nobility is not caressed by royalty, surrounded by sycophants, a theme for the illustrations of poetry and painting, she resisted all those blandishments so alluring and so difficult to withstand, and has not left behind her one single memorial of any of the weaknesses incidental to human vanity under circumstances of such powerful temptation. No prince led her in his train. No mercenary laureate succeeded in bribing her by his praises. And no portrait of her person, attractive as it might have been in the bloom of her youth and beauty, is, as far as I have means of knowing, in existence. The good old king extolled her. Mr. Pitt confided in her, the aristocratic party toadied her, Republicans admired her, and ladies envied her. Never was an elevation so dazzling, or a fall so clouded by the gloom of disappointment and neglect. But there is yet a moral to be drawn from her life which is pregnant with serious reflections. That she was more unhappy in her solitude than— in her unbending nature, she would stoop to avow. This diary of the last years of her existence but too plainly demonstrates. Although she derived consolation in retirement from the retrospect of the part she had played in her prosperity, yet her mind was embittered by some undefined but acute sense of past errors and although her buoyant spirits usually bore her up against the weight by which she was oppressed, still there were moments of poignant grief when all efforts at resistance were vain, and her very soul groaned within her. She was ambitious, and her ambition had been foiled. She loved irresponsible command, but the time had come when those over whom she had ruled defied her. She was dictatorial and exacting, but she had lost the talisman of that influence which alone makes people tolerate control when it interferes with the freedom of thought and action. She had neglected to secure wealth while she had it in her power but the feelings which prompted her princely munificence were as warm as ever, now that the means were gone which enabled her to gratify them. Her mind was in a perpetual struggle between delusive schemes and incompetent resources. She incurred debts, and she was doomed to feel the degradation consequent on them. She entertained visionary projects of aggrandizement, 
and was met by the derision of the world. She spurned the conventional rules of that society in which she had been bred, and perhaps violated propriety in the realization of a singularity in which she gloried. There was the rock on which she was finally wrecked. For as Madame de Stal somewhere says, a man may brave the censures of society, but a woman must accommodate herself to them. She was thought to defy her own nation, and they hurled the defiance back upon her. She held in contempt the gentler qualities of her own sex, who, in return, were not slow to resent the masculine characteristics on which she presumed to maintain her assumed position. She carried with her from England the disposition to conciliate, by kindness and forbearance, the fidelity and obedience of her domestics. But she was eventually led into undue harshness towards them, which became more and more exaggerated in her by the idleness, the ignorance, and irritating vices of her eastern household. Another important lesson may be gleaned from her life. We have a favorable opportunity of observing, in her example, how far the human understanding may, by its own natural powers unassisted by books, work its way to celebrity. Her intellects were so acute that she had little difficulty in comprehending all the moral and political questions discussed in her presence, and she consequently gathered information from very superior sources, as she enjoyed the intimacy of first-rate men. Still, she had but narrow views of general policy, of the rights of mankind, in fine, of politics and ethics in the abstract, inasmuch as the discussions which were carried on before her were the debates of parties and sects, having immediate reference merely to certain men and certain questions rather than presenting enlightened and comprehensive considerations grounded on philosophical principles. But it was here that her profound knowledge of mankind came into play, and this it was which impressed on her sayings and counsel the stamp of preeminent sagacity. Intercourse with the world, however, or even with cabinet ministers, although it may render us accomplished diplomatists, cannot make us statesmen in the true acceptation of the word. Least of all can it make us teachers and philosophers. We cannot solve a problem in mathematics unless we have previously traced the steps which led to it one by one. Nor can we ever arrive at precision on any subject until we have mastered its elements and made ourselves acquainted with the results of antecedent investigations. In this, therefore, lay the grand defect of Lady Hester's education. She was not only wanting, as almost all women are, in the philosophical power of generalization, but her reading was literally so circumscribed that her deficiency in what may be called book-learning often amounted to absolute ignorance. She said she despised books, but it was simply because she was never made aware how much valuable information they contain. She trusted everything to intuitive perception. Her constant denial of the utility of study founded on the conviction that education does not alter men's characters or change their innate disposition, is wholly independent of that other proposition, which recognizes knowledge as an edifice seated on a height to which we must climb step by step, taking care that each fundamental truth in the ascent 
shall be laid down with certainty in order to secure the solidity of the superincumbent materials. She disowned alike the benefits of learning and the necessity of the progressive acquisition of knowledge. Her ladyship jumped to conclusions in perfect ignorance of the researches and discoveries of previous inquirers. End of chapter 9, part 4《Chapter Nine, Part Five of Memoirs of the Lady Hester Stanhope, Volume Three, by Lady Hester Stanhope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Nine, Part Five. Lady Hester possessed none of the more graceful accomplishments of her sex, not from an ability to acquire them, for her remarks on music painting and other fine arts were always striking and apposite but because she preferred occupying her mind on matters more congenial to her peculiar tastes it cannot be doubted that she had all the opportunities usually afforded to the children of the nobility for the culture of the mind and liberal pursuits and attainments but she took no delight in such things, and only spoke of them slightly and incidentally. Popular opinion has ascribed the eccentricities of Lady Hester Stanhope to a crazed brain. It is not for me to venture upon a question of so delicate a nature. Lucius Junius Brutus was supposed to be insane, and played the part of an idiot until the proper time arrived for casting away the mask. Hamlet enacts madness for a purpose, and some writers go so far as to assert that Mahomet was insane, and that no enthusiast of a high order can achieve his ends and gain over proselytes to his views without a tincture of insanity. The dream of Lady Hester's life was sway and dominion. How to obtain the one or the other was the difficulty, for she was born a subject and excluded by her sex from vice royalties and governments. With the genius of a hero, she could neither take the command of fleets or armies nor preside in the councils of state. How far, then, she may have contemplated the possibility of acquiring power by endeavoring to establish a superstitious belief amongst those around her, and through them, over a wider range, that she possessed supernatural gifts. How far she may have tried to help out this design by professing implicit faith in strange and absurd legends and traditions, visions and tales. And how far the delusion, originally taken up for a purpose, may have ultimately reacted upon her own mind. These are speculations which I leave to others. But whilst I decline from motives of delicacy, and in deference to the public from whose award the decree must finally come, to pronounce any opinion on Lady Hester Stanhope's perfect sanity, I do not feel myself precluded from calling the reader's attention to one striking point of evidence in favor of it, which extends like a vein of pure ore through the whole course of her varied career. I have depicted, somewhat minutely, and without ostentation or disguise, her ladyship's habitual deportment and language towards her visitors, her household, and myself. I have introduced all those who have patiently followed me in these pages, into her sanctuary, have let them join in her conversations, have, as I hope, 
induced them to listen to her improbable stories of witchcraft and astrology, and have shared their incredulity in her supernatural mission. But I would now invite them to weigh against these seeming hallucinations the remarkable fact that in all her epistolary correspondence, down to the close of her life, not one aberration of intellect occurs. It is as if she had said to herself, those who come to glean ridicule from my words and presume to fathom my purposes will I make fools of and confound. They shall go away loaded with a cargo of their own choosing and shall retail countless absurdities in their books to amuse the world for a while. But when the time shall be accomplished, these absurdities shall rebound on themselves. For I will challenge the most diligent research to gather any from my writings, and then who will believe that I uttered them except to make the unworthy hearers ridiculous. The fact is, she may have spoken a great many strange things, but she has written none. I am in possession of a letter of hers, drawn up with attention on a very serious subject in the very plenitude of her mental powers. But I declare that it presents no superiority, either in style or composition, over the productions of her later years. Neither do her familiar letters, from first to last, leave an opening for the most critical cavalier to say that, down to the day of her death, she manifested any decline of reason, or disclosed one jot less of that sound sense or those discriminating powers which had made her the admiration of some of the leading characters of her times. Her letter to the Duke Maximilian of Bavaria breathes as much delicacy of sentiment as if it had issued from her boudoir in Downing Street. Her condolence with the Beirut merchant is more profound in reasoning, though less epigrammatic, than that of Servius Sulpicius of Cicero on the death of his daughter Tullia. And her appeal to the good feeling of her countrymen against the uncalled-for interference of the foreign office in her private affairs is inferior to no production of our ablest combatants against the abuses of authority. One point more remains to be touched upon. Lady Hester Stanhope, the advocate of the divine right of sovereigns, the stickler for the exclusive privileges of the aristocracy, she, who treated with ineffable ridicule and disdain the presumption of people, who, belonging to the class of commoners, set up claims of equality with the noble-born, was herself weak enough to betray irritation and even resentment towards that still higher power in the state to which our allegiance is ever due. Of our beloved queen, to whose sacred majesty she did homage in the abstract, she could not forbear speaking irreverently on many occasions. The letter which she wrote to her majesty in reference to the sequestration of her pension, was as unpardonable in diction as it was unjustifiable in substance. But great allowances are to be made for her, and they alone, who know the trying circumstances in which she was placed, can feel the full force of the plea that might be alleged in mitigation of her offence. My task is done. It has been one of no ordinary difficulty. I have had to undeceive the world respecting the real life of a distinguished woman. 
who in her day occupied a large share of its attention, and whose ill-defined celebrity was based chiefly on the accounts of travelers, written no doubt in good faith, but in grievous ignorance of the truth. I have had to remove the veil which shrouded her existence, to disperse the imaginary attributes with which the fancy of most readers had invested her, to dissipate the splendor thrown over her retirement, and to substitute unpleasant facts for eastern fables. Let it not be suspected that, in doing this, I have overstepped the bounds of professional confidence or violated the sacred intimacies of domestic life. My object has been to vindicate the fame of a persecuted lady, whose memory I honor, and most of whose actions have been misrepresented, and in pursuing this object with frankness and integrity, I have only fulfilled a plain duty, imposed upon me by her constant denunciations of the injustice which the English had done to the purity of her motives, a duty distinctly enjoined by her frequent appeals to me that I should make public some circumstances of her life, which might set them right and correct their judgment concerning her conduct using as much as possible her own words, indeed, I may say entirely, I have unavoidably introduced the names of many individuals yet alive, and of others but lately removed from the scene of ambition, envy, and political strife. The utmost delicacy consistent with the utmost candor has been observed in a task which presented such a dilemma of difficulties. And if any person should feel hurt at any of the disclosures in this work, I can assure them that, due regard being had to the state of mental irritation to which wounded feelings had brought Lady Hester Stanhope, they will do no wrong in considering all the acrimonious passages they may detect in these pages merely as a scene out of Timon of Athens, a burst of spleen against mankind, produced by a long series of mortifications, wrongs, and disappointments. End of chapter 9 End of Memoirs of the Lady Hester Stanhope, Volume 3 by Lady Hester Stanhope. Read by Phyllis Vincelli.